All rules for one thousand. All right, uh, let's do this one first. Aristotle says the human function is to what? Sorry? Be rational. Yeah, be rational. And if we're rational in our, deep in our soul, then we'll live virtuously and we'll achieve a happy life. Yeah? So Aristotle says that every, well, let's, let's evaluate this idea. Hand up if you think that all human beings have a, a purpose that's part of our nature and that it is to be rational, or virtuous, or happy, or some mix of those ideas. Yeah. Okay, about five and a half. Five and a half. Hand up if you think this idea is a bit silly. Alright, more people. Would anyone like to say why it's a good idea? <coughs> it's plausible. Plausible? Most people would agree with it, you think? Yeah. Okay, nice. Um, what kind of method is it called when we go to most to see what most people think? Indoxic, yep, the indoxic method. Oh, it's not naive. What's naive thing again? Naive relativism. That's the idea that you know all your moral judgments are just like, oh, it's just up to everyone's opinion. Oh, okay. Just do it Yeah. Okay, so it seems like a lot of people would agree that a, a well lived human life is. Something involving rationality or virtual happiness. Would anyone like to argue against this idea? Yeah, yeah. Andy? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, human function is not like, being rational, but like first um go through the basic necessity, like to move the okay. and being rational is like the luxury to derive from satisfying the basic necessity Alright, nice one. So you're saying we do have a, a purpose? But it's just our purpose is to feed ourselves, make sure we're okay and to live. Basically just to survive. Yeah? Uh, hand up if you agree with Andy. Our purpose is to survive and then rationality and happiness is a luxury as well. Yeah? Well, kind of agree though. Kind of agree. Yeah. Some people are convinced. Not, not a few. Did anyone have a different objection? Or a different answer? Agora? Uh, I believe there's no objective function. And it depends on how you use your body or your... It's not a problem. It depends on how somebody else uses you. For example, and it's kind of weird, but if I, uh, you go to a cannibal civilization and they kill you, yeah. your function will be to be free. Okay. It wouldn't be to be a cause of people. So you're saying your function just depends on how you're used or how you use yourself, something like that. Yeah? Okay, so does that mean we can just make up what our function is? Do you reckon? Yeah? Okay. Hand up if you said that humans can make up what our function is. You had something like that in your answer. Yeah, okay. But Andy says our function is to survive. And those two answers, do they go together or not? They can. So you can define your function like above that maybe. So maybe we have like a core function that we all have to do, but then beyond that, there are purposes that we can each achieve or something, yeah? Although it seems like the cannibalism example doesn't really work with the survive example, yeah? Did anyone argue that we have no purpose? <laughs> A little bit. Jimmy? No one argued that? Nick? Yeah. Yourselves? Um, it's not really much good, it's actual purpose. It's just a made up concept? Yeah. All right, talk to the person next to you. Is this, do you find that believable? Is the idea that we just have no purpose, is that possible, is that believable? Talk to the person next to you briefly. Okay, so no one has to have a purpose. So like a purpose. What if you're like, 
So sorry for that, but Andy's purpose was to survive, right? Yeah. And he said that that's a purpose that we all share, is yeah. to survive. And that's, Aristotle says that's whose or what's purpose? That's the purpose of plants, actually. Plants have the purpose of living and growing and surviving, right? So Andy's saying that we share that purpose with them. But is it possible for a person to, to change their purpose so radically that survival isn't part of it anymore. Can anyone think of what we would call that? Suicide. Suicide, maybe. Yeah? If someone doesn't have a purpose, they might commit suicide. But what would you call it if someone decided to do something that they then had to die for, but they were committed to in some sort of purposeful way? Stunts. 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 Sorry? Some sort of sacrifice. Some sort of self-sacrifice, right? We can imagine a person being willing to sacrifice themselves for some higher purpose, even at the expense of being able to survive. Does that make sense to everyone? Uh, oh, yeah. yes. In that case, so let's, yeah, so war's a good example. Let's say that you're, you're willing to sign up to fight for something in a war, or someone is, a soldier is, and they're willing to die for whatever their war is about, whatever they believe in. Talk to the person next to you. Do you think they've redefined their own purpose? They really have a purpose and they've redefined it? Or do you think it's more likely that actually their purpose is to survive and they've they've betrayed their purpose? They're not living up to it. Talk to the person next to you. What do you think? Do they really have a purpose? maximize pleasure as much as possible. So Aristotle is going against that idea, right? Particularly because for Calicles, pleasuring or finding pleasure is going to be very like in, uh, very different depending on who you are. Yeah, and like how much pleasure you can achieve, etc. His way is almost a bit more subjective. People get to decide what is good for them, and then they just go out and do whatever they can. Yeah? And we're going to talk about Nietzsche a bit, and he sort of radically redefines value oh in a pretty substantial way. But Aristotle is not interested in saying that everyone has a different purpose. Aristotle is interested in saying that everyone's purpose is basically the same because we're all humans. We all need to aspire to achieving the same kind of luck. Yeah? 
Last one to finish this up. Aristotle says that every human action aims at, what would we call it? What would he call it? The good or, we're going to say eudaimonia. <coughs> Can we write this down as well? <coughs> so like a deep satisfaction or happiness. Happiness for Aristotle is the end of the good life. And every action aims towards that, remember. So being noble is good because it makes us happy. Being virtuous for Aristotle is only good because it makes us happy. You should do the right thing because it will make you happy. Kind of selfish in that way, you think? Like if, if you're doing the right thing but it makes you unhappy, that's not good enough for Aristotle. Yeah? But also for Aristotle, if you've got the right attitude, there's no action that you should do if it doesn't make you happy. It's kind of selfish in that way. All right, Aristotle says every human action aims at happiness, at eudaimonia. Uh, the all roads to Rome fallacy. Does anyone know this? I'm not sure if it was in the text. All roads lead to Rome. That was an old expression. Back when the Roman Empire was massive, and they used to build roads everywhere, it was said that all roads lead to Rome because they all started there and they all fanned out and they all went that way. So all the trade, Rome controlled all the trade, they made stacks of money because all the roads led to Rome. So is that is that true that all roads lead to Rome? Rome is like the end of all the roads. Is that right? Well, it's kind of not right. Yeah, because there's actually two ends to all the roads, isn't there? So all the roads do lead to Rome, but they actually all lead everywhere else as well. Yeah? So the, the fallacy, or the objection to this idea, is that, well, our actions do lead to happiness, but they also lead to other things, like virtue, yeah? Or being a moral person, being a good family member, yeah? Being a good student. And it's not clear that these things are aimed at happiness, yeah? Maybe they're ends in themselves. So let's write that objection out. But just because our actions lead to, well, let's say aim at, that doesn't mean Happiness is the sole and ultimate aim of our lives. last time? Were we on the end of chapter 4 or was it really before we were up to 5 yet? We passed that? We finished 4. We almost finished 4. Yeah, I think we finished 4. Did we start 5? I think we did start 5. Yeah, we did start 5. Oh, we did. Yeah, that's right. Where is it? Ah, uh, yep, we finished five, I think. Almost. Alright, so really quickly recapping chapter five. Aristotle says that there are, we have three capacities of the soul. Uh, they are passions, by which he means emotions. Can we, can we control feeling emotions? Yes. Maybe to a certain extent by habituating ourselves. Some people more than others. Yeah, some people more than others. But 
mostly though, we don't hold people responsible if they feel anger in a situation, in a certain situation, do we? Yeah? Like if uh, someone accidentally tips a chair over and someone just like feels enraged, yeah? It's just a sudden response. We don't judge them for feeling enraged, but we do judge them if they what? If they overreact, yeah? Then we would judge them, yeah? So we don't judge people on their passions. People have capacities and then there's states of character. We do judge people based on their states of character. So we're at the middle of column 29. Maybe we'll go from, again, we feel anger and fear. Can everyone see that? Oh, right, the top. Near the top, yeah. Yeah, top 29. So, again, we feel anger and fear without choice, but the virtues and modes of choice are involved choice. Further, in respect to the passions, we are said to be moved. Um, emotions move us. Uh, but in respect of the virtues and the vices, we are said not to be moved, but to be disposed in a particular way. What would it mean to be disposed towards a virtue? So to be to have a disposition is to have like a state of character. Yeah? So if I was disposed to act bravely in a situation, you would call me a brave person. That's all that, that means. Yes. But he's saying that to have a virtue is to have a kind of state of character. So we might say of Abdul that Abdul's quite a brave person. And we're talking about his disposition. We mean that his personality, his disposition, his character, the way he is, means that in situations that require bravery, Abdul is quite brave. Does that make sense? Yeah. He's pretty happy with that. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, so we're not, we're not moved. Virtues and vices don't just kind of happen to us, uh, but we're disposed in particular ways towards them. For these reasons also, they're not capacities, for we're neither called good or bad, nor praised or blamed. For the simple capacity of feeling the passions, again, we have the capacities by nature. We are not made good or bad by nature. We've spoken of this before. How do we know we're not made good or bad by nature again? It was the thing about trying to teach a stone to fall upwards. Do you guys remember that? Yes. Yeah? Yes. So how do we know we're not good or bad by nature? Because it's just a natural state. Uh, uh, to go into that. It's our natural state to... Is it our natural state to be good or bad? No, it's to be able to be... Like, you, you can... You're not naturally good or bad. Yep. You're naturally able to become good. Perfect. Yeah, you're receptive to, you're able to become good or bad. We're not naturally one or the other in the same way that a stone naturally falls to the ground. Yeah, you can't fight your nature. We can naturally be either good or bad through habit. Yeah. Cool. If then the virtues are neither passions nor capacities, all that remains is that they should be states of character. Thus we have stated what virtue is in respect of its kind, is what Jesus said. All good so far? Alright, I'd like you to quickly turn to the person next to you. We've talked about intellectual and moral virtues. I just want you to list six moral virtues with the person next to you so we get a good idea of the kinds of thing we're talking about. List six moral virtues. Just a quick one for that one. Yes, I'm out to me. Bravery. Bravery. Temperance. Yeah, temperance, which means self control. Courage. Selfless. Bravery. Also, bravery goes with adultery. 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 Whoa, adultery. Whoa, wait. What is it? How about we want loyalty? <laughs> courage. Oh. 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 Strength. Selflessness. Yep. Compassion. Compassion. Merciful. Oh. Yeah, I like that. I'm just gonna write kindness. Forgiving. Maybe forgiveness. Yep. Forgiving. 
Fairness What? Fairness The United States Okay Not process of the United States Would self-control go on Yeah, yeah. yeah. self-control with temperance Yeah, okay. here's about the class of 92 This is the class of 90 You guys think of any other virtues? Humility Humility yeah. Humility 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 Jamie Garner. Those aren't examples he's, he's of what he's He's very good. He's talented. Humble. Excel to his ability. Fish and Fish and Any others? Uh, Any others I'll do? Um, humility. Um, humbleness. Sorry. <laughs> humbleness. Uh, humility. Um, um, strength. Is strength a virtue? No, no, not like that strength. Like strength. Control your wishes. Yes. Temperance. Uh, talk to the person next to you. Is physical strength a moral virtue? No. Talk to the person next to you quickly. Yeah, intellectual virtues. Like a self development. Oh, let's talk about the class of 19. Yeah, is it? Sorry, we gotta remember these names. Can anyone think of another moral virtue? As flops. Charity. What is a future balance when I laugh my words? He is Greenwood. He is a legend. Yeah, he's had to see him Do you guys reckon we can get three more just to balance out my list? Charity. Yeah, I'll lock up for my OCD. Yeah, thanks. What's, what's the one where you OCD go against your mind? Like, determine, like someone tells you to do something, you go to You do, You do the extra bit. Yeah. We could say maybe determination or perseverance. Well, is that something like what you Organization mean? resilience. So could you say uh, share? Do you reckon being sure. organized is a caring. virtue? No. Is it a moral virtue? Sure, it's caring. No, it's sure. it's organization. Organization. Resilient. Talk to the person next to you. Is it morally good to be better organized or not? No. no. Well, resilient. Is that other person's anger, sure. But not really sure. Resilience is a good one. One more. Good. Being good. Sharing. Sharing. What would we call that? Isn't that charity? Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, it's a little bit like charity. Yeah, makes sense. But it's a bit different. Being nice. What about instead of sharing, we write being generous? Yeah. Or well, we could, like, actually put that up in charity too. Being nice. Sharing. sharing. Yeah, I think. Nice, being nice goes with kindness. Uh, 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 someone could say, Is that moral? Uh, smiling. Smiling, yeah, because like if someone has a. Kindness. Come on, guys, make one more moral virtue. Just erase the Jimmy and then just bounce out. I want to do this. Can I get one more? Passion. 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 Like passion. That's not moral. That's not moral. That's like that. Empathy. 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 Uh, Aristotle says to choose the intermediate and we're going to talk about two different kinds of the intermediate when he says the intermediate what does he mean the mean the middle, ground. The, mean, the middle ground the middle way the middle road so we must however not only describe virtue as a state of character but also say what sort of state it is we may remark then that every virtue or excellence brings uh, both brings into good condition the thing of which it is the excellence and makes the work of that thing be done well. So the excellence of the eye makes both the eye and its work good. So the eye becomes excellent, the thing in itself becomes excellent, and the work is done well. Yeah? If we're a virtuous person, we become brave, and the thing is done bravely. Yep, does that make sense? Cool, so a good state of character leads to things being, the action being uh, in that form, with that form and gives the person that state of character. Uh, the thing of which is the excellence that makes the work of that thing be done well, I oh, have yeah, the excellence of the eye makes both the eye and it's very good. For it is by the excellence of the eye that we see well. Similarly, the excellence of the horse makes a horse both good in itself and good at running. 
and it carrying its rider and it awaiting the attack of the enemy. Therefore, if this is true in every case, the virtue of man will also be the state of character which makes a man good and makes him do his own work well. One interesting consequence of this is that for Aristotle, if you're not doing your work well, you're not virtuous. Yeah, so if you're like trying really hard but it's not working, you haven't figured it out yet. Wait, so if you're not good, if you don't get a good ATAR, so you're not virtuous. If you don't get a good ATAR, he would say that you haven't achieved the intellectual virtue that you're seeking. Yeah. If okay. ATARs are a good representation so of that intellectual virtue, which might not hold always. <laughs> But yeah, does that make sense? <laughs> so let's let's say it this way in a way that makes a little bit less controversial sense. Because ATARs are an interesting kind of tool. But if you're doing a maths test, yeah, and you're trying to learn how to do this one thing, let's say factorizing, yeah. yeah, and it's a test out of ten, and you get nine out of ten, yeah, we'd say your work is done fairly well, and you're fairly good at the virtue, the excellence of doing factorizing. Yeah? And we'd say that factorizing, the ability to factorize is like added to your intellectual character. Something like that. Yeah? But if you get 4 out of 10, you're not there yet. Yeah? yeah? But importantly, if you're trying to do things and things are just happening badly around, maybe that means you're not virtuous. Right? Like I'm a quite a good driver, but if someone hits me with their car, I've had a car crash, does that mean that I'm not a good driver? Well, for Aristotle, maybe yes. Yeah? So this theory doesn't really seem to take into account things when uh, things like luck when you're unsuccessful. Yeah? Aristotle's kind of a bit elitist that way. He's like, if you're doing well, you are well. If you're doing badly, well, you're not good. Yes, you have a son. Aristotle? Yeah. He did. Do you want to know his name was? Yeah. Nicomachus. Nicomachus. He, he compiled oh. these notes. <laughs> oh. Do you reckon Nicomachus was reading this, writing it down, thinking like, that's why Dad beat me with a stick when I did the bad thing. <laughs> 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 Do you reckon he did that? He yeah. probably had that going through his mind. He's like, oh, that's why. And then probably thought, oh, I'm going to really question my Dad's parenting. When I, I'm going to do things differently. Do you reckon? Sounds good. Everyone had some different ideas. Let's get going. Uh, Therefore, do we get to that bit? Yeah. It is true in, this, in every case, the virtue of man will also be the set of character which makes man good and makes him do his own work well. How this is to happen, we have stated already, but it will be made plain also by the following consideration of the specific nature of virtue. So, let's have a look. In everything that is continuous and divisible, it's possible to take more, less, or an equal amount, and that either in terms of the thing itself or relatively to us, and that equal is an intermediate between excess and defect. Let's just keep reading. By the intermediate in the object, I mean that which is equidistant, equidistant from each of the extremes, which is one and the same for all. By the intermediate relatively to us, that which is neither too much nor too little. And this is not one nor the same for all. For instance, if 10 is many and two is few, Six is the intermediate taken in terms of the object, for it exceeds and is exceeded by an equal amount. That is intermediate according to ar ar arithmetical, arithmetical proportion. But the intermediate relative to us is not to be taken so. If 10 pounds is too much for a particular person to eat and too, too little, it does not follow that the trainer will order six pounds. But this, is also, this also is perhaps too much for the person who is to take it or too little. Too little for Milo, who's a famous wrestler. Too much for the beginner in athletic exercises. The same is true of running and wrestling, thus a master of any art, it avoids success and defect, but seeks the intermediate and chooses this, the intermediate not in the object, but relatively to us. So, there are two different kinds of intermediate. There's like an objective intermediate, and there's a relative intermediate. Which one should we be thinking about when we're trying to be virtuous? Relative to us, yeah? Do you remember the example I used of Nick trying to run a marathon? Yeah. If Nick can regularly run 10 kilometers, yeah, let's say he can run 20 kilometers at his max effort, and let's say that 10 kilometers is not very hard for Nick. For Nick, relative to him, an intermediate amount for him to run, which is a good amount for him to run when training, is 15 kilometers. Yeah, but that wouldn't be a, a good amount for me to run because my max is six kilometers, yeah? And my low amount, like an easy amount, is one. So an intermediate amount for me to run 
quick maths in my head, someone. Ooh, three and a half? Yeah, three and a half kilometers, right? It's a good amount for me to run, yeah? And that actually works out to be about the amount that I probably would run okay level for training, yeah? Nick, can you run 15 kilometers pretty easily? Never tried. Never tried? <laughs> okay, so it's a bad example maybe for that. Does everyone see how a, the idea of a relative intermediate works? Yeah, are yeah. we okay with that? Yes. All right, so then let's say um, a spider appears in the back of the room. How could the intermediate uh, virtue of achieving bravery be different for all of us? Kill half of it. Someone could be terrified of spiders not, not climbing out the window might be like the middle road for them. Yeah? They're really bad at bravery, and so for them, maybe the mean for now is not climbing out the window. Maybe the mean for humans in general is acting in some way in response to something. If you want to kill it. But some people are really used to spiders and they might go over to it and they might not need much bravery to like hold it in their hand and give it a little pat on the head. Oh, Aww. Yeah? I'm like, dumb. That's terrible. Let's uh, write out something about the different kinds of intermediate. We're so uncivilized. We're still hitting the wall. Two kinds of intermediate virtue. Thank you. 
but seeks the intermediate and chooses this, the intermediate not any object relatively to us. We do the middle, the right amount for us. It is thus then that every art does its, art, its work well by looking at the intermediate and judging its works by this standard. So we often say of good works of art that it's not possible either to take away or to add anything. It's implying that adding more or taking away something would destroy the goodness of works of art and that the mean preserves it. And good artists, as we say, look to this in their work. Do you guys all get that idea? If you have a painting, the perfect version of that painting is where if you took anything away, it would be worse. But if you added anything else, it would also be worse. Yeah. There's a perfect amount you should add to a painting, Aristotle says, that is the perfect version of that painting. The middle amount. Talk to the person next to you, is that a good analogy? Is this convincing? Is there a perfect version of a painting where if you take anything away, it's worse, or if you add anything, it's worse? Talk to the person next to you. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How can it be perfect? Like a yeah. red bar? Yeah. Aristotle says if it's got like, just the right yeah. amount of the right sort of yeah. stuff. How do you know it's the right yeah. amount? Yeah. We used to have to be an artist, you have to be a master artist, like Aristotle. It's not pretty good. Yeah, actually. Yeah. 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 Me too. Yeah. When you're a story hat, you want to make it as possible as you make like a new penny style. Is it more or less perfect to use the blue rather than the red? I just saw it on the what if someone uses blue and someone uses red? Do you have to do it? Which one is the best? 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 Which one is the 
Yeah. Maybe the artists that think there is a person who, maybe all the artists agree that there's a person who, but everyone else is like, oh, this is going to be good. Alright guys, come back to Hands up if you think there is a perfect version of every painting and it's the mid middle road. Yeah. Does anyone think this is a silly idea? Yes. Oh, it's just a chorus. This is a chorus. Yeah, yeah. Let's say Mr. Sakaris has his art class and two people in the art class do very similar paintings. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But one of them has like a slightly different style. Yeah. Yeah. Very similar paintings. Yeah. 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 Ye
and pity and in general pleasure and pain may be felt both too much and too little, and in both cases not well. Um, what, would, what would it be to feel too much fear? Can we all imagine a situation where someone feels too much fear? They're like crippled by anxiety. Maybe they're rocking in a ball in the corner, right? They, they, they can't function. They're feeling way too much fear. They're just overcome by anxiety. What would it be to feel too little fear? Not be scared of anything. You're not scared of anything? There are some people, and we think they have something wrong with their brain, where they can't feel fear at all, and they typically become like motocross stunt people because they are happy to like ride a BMX around the top of skyscrapers on the edges and do like flips and stuff because they, they just can't process fear. Yeah? And it doesn't make sense to them. They're like, well, I understand that I'll die if I go off the, the, the edge, but like, why would I be worried about it? I'll just do my best to not fall off. Genius. Yeah? Now Aristotle would say that that's not enough fear. He'd say that a bit of fear is a healthy amount and we need an intermediate amount of fear. So we need enough fear to be worried about bad consequences, but not enough to cripple us from acting. Yeah? All right. I'd like you to highlight this next bit. But to feel them, but to feel them at the right times, these are the things we need to feel. But to feel them at the right times with reference to the right objects, towards the right people, with the right motive, and in the right way is what is both intermediate and best. And this is characteristic of virtue. <coughs> we might say someone was brave if they felt confidence and fear to the right extent, in the right amount, and only if they do it with reference to the right objects, like spears and walls, uh, towards the right people, the enemy and friends, with reference, with, uh, with the right motive to defend your country or your family, and in the right way of what is both intermediate and best. That's how you live a virtuous life, what Alright, similarly with regard to actions also there is excess, defect and intermediate. Now virtue is concerned with passions and actions in which excess is a form of failure and so is defect. While the intermediate is praised as a form of success, and being praised in both being successful, both characteristics of virtue. Therefore, virtue is a kind of mean, a kind of middle road, as we have seen, it aims at what is intermediate. Next page. Ooh. All right. Because goodness is the middle road, and badness or failure is excessive effects, let's keep going. Again, it's possible to fail in many ways. The evil belongs to the class of the unlimited, is the Py Pythagorean's conjecture, and good to that of the limited. While to succeed is possible only in one way, for which reason also one is easy and the other difficult. To miss the mark easy, to hit it is difficult. For these reasons also then, excess and defect are characteristic of vice and the mean of virtue. For men are good in but one way, but bad in many. So for Aristotle, to be virtuous, you have to hit the middle mark. And if you miss the middle mark, then you're not virtuous. You're acting and you have vice, like cowardice or greediness. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. All right. Should we, do you want to write a quick note on that? Yeah. All right. So for Aristotle, there is one best way. Yeah, but it's better. 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 I don't know why. No, it doesn't.
Target. If you added any lines to it, it'd be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Disagree? Many ways. Yeah. Is there some truth in this, do you think? Lots of ways to be bad in situations, and only one way to be good. Yeah. Uh, what do one way? Yes. After you take drugs. Yes. You like drugs. Like drugs. You don't take half drugs. You don't take half drugs. <laughs> don't do half drugs, kids. We want, don't do half drugs. Right. Yeah. Just like that. I don't know. yeah. This, this idea of the middle ground seems to be. I don't know. We'll we'll discuss how useful it is in a minute. Sort of unreliable. All right, let's keep going. For men are good in but one way, and bad, but bad in many. Virtue, then, is the state of character concerned with choice, lying in the mean, that is the mean relative to us, this being determined by reason, and by that reason which the man of practical wisdom would determine it. What's our practical wisdom? Wisdom that we get from... Actions, experience, good. So someone who's experienced in an area has the kind of wisdom that you need to reason your way towards acting in the appropriate amount. Make sense? Cool. Uh, now it is a mean between two vices, that which depends on excess and that which depends on defect. And again, it is a mean because the vices respectively fall short of or exceed what is right in both passions and actions. While well, virtue both finds and chooses that which is intermediate. Hence, in respect to what it is, the definition which states its essence, virtue is a mean with regard to what is best and right in extreme. But not every action or passion admits of a mean. Like taking drugs. <laughs> For some have names that already imply badness. For example, spite, shamelessness, envy, and in the case of actions, adultery, theft, murder, taking drugs. For all of these and such like things imply by their names that they are themselves bad, nor, and not the excesses or deficiencies of them. It's not possible then ever to be right with regard to them, one must always be wrong. Nor does goodness or badness with regard to such things depend on committing adultery with the right woman at the right time and in the right way, but simply to do any of them is to go wrong. Does that, right? does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. You can't do theft the right way if you just like are really smart and have a good banter. Yeah. Theft is always wrong. Uh, it would be equally absurd then to expect that in unjust, cowardly, and self-indulgent action there should be a mean, an excess, and a deficiency. For at that rate, there would be a mean of excess and of deficiency, an excess of excess and a deficiency of deficiency. But as there's no excess and deficiency of temperance and courage, because what is intermediate is in a sense an extreme. So two of the actions we have mentioned, there is no mean, nor any excess and deficiency. But however they are done, they are wrong. In general, there is neither a mean or excess and deficiency, nor excess and deficiency of a mean. 
saying that if you act extremely bravely, with as much bravery as you can muster, really, you're still sitting in the intermediate between the two things he's talking about. Excess bravery being, being foolhardy and acting rashly, and not enough bravery being uh, acting in a cowardly way. But you can have an extreme amount of bravery in the sense that you have the right amount of bravery. Make sense? Yeah. Not really? Or are you just a bit sus about this whole idea? Yeah, Okay. Let's get going. Uh, are we at but as there is? Yeah. But as there is no excess and deficiency of temperance and courage. Oh no, we did that, right? Yeah. Oh, Thirty-two. Right? Yeah. Seven. We're up to seven. Yeah. Excellent. The above proposition illustrated by reference to particular virtues. Let's talk about some actual examples. We must, however, not only make this general statement, but also apply it to the individual facts. Do you guys want to do these in small groups? Or do you want to read them as a class? Class. Hand up the class. I'll ask by what actual other readers I've got. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Jeremy, uh, Jeremy. Jeremy. Oh, start for us. Yeah, get yeah, back to I love you. Okay. We must, however, not only make this general statement, but also apply it to the individual facts. For among statements about conduct the about conduct those which are general apply more widely, but those which are particular are more true, since conduct has to do with individual cases, and our statements must harmonize with the facts in these cases. We may take these cases from our table with regard to feelings of fear and confidence. Confidence courage is the mean of the people who exceed who he who exceeds in fearlessness has no name. Many of the states have no name. While the man who exceeds in confidence is rash, and he who exceeds in fear and falls short in confidence is a coward. With regard to pleasures and pains, not all of them, and not so much with regard to the pains, the mean is temperance, the excess self-indulgence. Persons deficient with regard to the pleasures are not often found. Hence, such persons also have received no name. But let us call them insensible. With regard to giving and taking of money, the mean is liberality. Uh, the excess and the defect for prodigality and meanness. In this in these actions people exceed and fall short in contrary ways. The prodigal exceed in spending and fall short in taking, while the mean man exceeds in taking and fall short in spending. At present we have given a mere outline of summary and are satisfied with this. Later these states will be more exactly determined. With regard to money, there are also other dispositions. A mean, magnificent, for the magnificent man differs from the little man, the former deal with the large sums, the with the latter with small ones, an excess, tastelessness and vulgar vulgarity, and a deficiency. <laughs> yes. Uh, what does that mean? say? Niggardliness. <laughs> Niggardliness. Uh, these differ from the states opposed to liberality and the mode of their difference will be stated later. Keep going? Yep. With regard to honour and dishonour, the mean is proper pride, the excess of man is a sort of empty and the deficiency is undue humility. And as we said, the liberality was related to magnificence. Differing it from dealing with small sums, so there is a state simply related to public pride, being concerned with small honours while that is concerned with great. For it is possible to desire honour as one ought, and more than one ought, and less. And the man who exceeds it in his desires is called ambitious. The man who falls short and ambitious, while the intermediate person has no name. The dispositions are also are also amendments, except that of the uh, ambitious man is called ambition. Hence, the people who are at the extremes lay claims to the middle place, to the middle place, and we are and we ourselves sometimes call the intermediate person ambitious and sometimes unambitious, and sometimes praise the ambitious and sometimes the unambitious. The reason of our doing this will be stated in what follows. But now let us speak of the remaining states according to the method which has been indicated. 
Genau. With regard, with regard to anger, also there is an excess of efficiency and the means. Although they can scarcely be said to have names, yet since before the intermediate person, good tempered, let us call the main good temper. Of the persons at the extreme who let the, let the one who exceeds be called irascible, and his vice irascibility. And the man who falls short and unirascible sort of person, and the deficiency unirascibility. Nice. Let's pause there. That's a good one. Um, with anger, let's do it with anger because I think it's a good example. If you are generally not a very angry person, we say you're unirascible. What, what does that mean? Brian, if you're not a very angry person, what would we call you? Calm, yeah, but we mean calm in the sense of too calm, too chilled, yeah? Like uh, your friend is like, hey, can I borrow your phone? Thanks, and they take it and they never give it back. And you're like, oh, cool. Yeah, oh well, guess I'll get a new phone from mum and dad. <laughs> yeah, and then you go home to mum and dad and they're appropriately disposed towards anger, so what do they say? Get the phone back. Go get your phone back, what are you doing? Silly kid, yeah? Or maybe they say, I'm very I'm disappointed sorry. with you, Avery. <laughs> yeah? Uh, and if, if your, your parents are irascible, what, how might they react when you say, oh, my friend's borrowing my phone forever? What might they do? Beat you, right? <laughs> they be like, what? This is crazy. I'm going to take the price of the phone out of your... Skin or something, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Your organs. So getting probably a bit too full on. But you get my point, right? That would be way too angry a person. That would be a ridiculous reaction. So there's a right amount of anger to feel, and there's a right state of character that means you are disposed well towards anger. You feel not too much and not too little. That's good. Yeah? Uh, would anyone like to read next? The next bit? I'm not going to say anything. That's some last week. I think I'm doing shit. <laughs> Jeremy. No, <laughs> no. I read my part. Kevin, can you read for us for me? Ha 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 ha. I'm jumping in. I haven't seen anything to go. With the box and angle of the tag, also there is an excess of the fish you see in the movie. Oh, no, they can. What? Oh, wait. Well, there was a trail. Where are you going? Come on, wait. Hey, calm down. Get your act together. So there are also yeah. <laughs> there are also three other moves which have a certain likeness to the one that they don't want to get like to. But they are also certain into possible worth and actions that differ in that one is concerned with the truth in the spirit. The other two with pleasantness, and of this one kind of thing considered it is given to be the other in all the circumstances of our life. We must therefore speak of these two. That we may that we may the better see that in all things we is praiseworthy and extreme need of praiseworthy or right, but worthy or low. Now most of these states also have no names, but we must try, as in the other cases, to invent names ourselves so that we may be clear and even taught. If we grant the truth, then the intermediate is a truthful sort of person and the mean may be called truthful. But a pretense which exaggerates is gracefulness and a person characterized by it, a gross and that which understates is not always the and a person character, characterized by it, not, not always. With regard to pleasantness in the giving of public amusement, the intermediate person is ready witted and the disposition ready with The excess is familiar. And the person characterized by it in a couple of people. While the man before shown is a sort of bore and a state of boorishness. With regard to the remaining kind of pleasantness, that which is exhibited in life again. The man who is pleasant in the right way is friendly, and the mean is friendliness. While a man who exceeds in this of obsequious person, Good. if he has no end in it. A flutter of the If he is aiming at his own value, and a man who falls short and is unpleasant and also his hands is a quarrelsome and strange sort of person. 
the opposite means of the pattern will concern with the pattern. Since shame is not a motion, and yet praise is, is external to the monster. So even the, in these matters, one matters to be intermediate and the world to exceed. As for instance, the bash for man who is ashamed of everything. For he who falls short was not ashamed of anything at all his shame. An intermediate person is not. Righteous indignation is a mean between envy and spot. And these states are so unmet with the pain and pleasure that are thought of fortune to one man. The man who is characterized by righteous indignation is pain and at undeserved good fortune. The envious man going beyond it is pain at all good fortune. And the spiteful man falls so short of the pain that he even rejoices. But these states but but these states there will be an opportunity of describing elsewhere with regard to justice, since it has been not one simple thing. We shall often describe the other states, distinguish its two kinds, and say how each of them is a me. And similarly, we shall treat also the rational world. Nice this last one is about the way that you respond to good things happening or bad things happening to your neighbours, to your friends, to the people around you. So what are the what are the options for Aristotle? Abdul? How can you respond to the things, the good things that happen to people? You can praise them. Yeah, you can say, oh, good for you. Yeah? Is that the medium, the excess or the deficiency? I think that's deficiency. Deficiency? Not enough? You say good for you, that's not enough? Let's have a, a look. Uh, the man who is characterized by righteous indignation is pained at undeserved good fortune. The envious man going beyond him is pained at all good fortune. And the spiteful man falls so far short of being pained that he even rejoices. Talk to the person next to you, figure out what this means, please. Textbook, can we turn to page 241, please? 241. And I would like you, please, to start filling out this table. We have a table here where he talks about different traits, virtues, and there's a mean, a, de a defect, and an excess for all of these virtues. So we have things like fear, confidence, and courage, temperance, charity, gratitude to money, honor, anger, truth, or honesty, funny, friendly, shameful, uh, and your response to the virtues of others. If you like, you can write it in your textbook. I don't mind, write it straight in, totally up to you. Or you can write this uh, in your book, sure. that is totally fine. Uh, would you like to do one together? Yes. yes. <laughs> Which one should we do? Should we do a hard one? Let's do uh, honesty. This is one where he's talking about being mock modest. Do you guys know what that is? It says, with regard to truth, then, at about line 19. At line 19. See that? So, with regard to truth, uh, then the intermediate is a truthful sort of person, and the mean may be called truthfulness, while the pretense, which exaggerates, is boastfulness, 
and the person characterized by it is a boaster. And that which understates is mock modesty and the person characterized by it is mock modest. Let's say someone comes up to you and they're like, oh, how'd you do in your test? What's the appropriate response? I did pretty, did you do pretty well? Probably did all right. Let's say you did, let's say you got eight out of 10, right? You could say, oh, I did pretty well, I got 80%. And that would be a truthful kind of honest response to give, right? Yeah. But what would a boastful response be to give? I, I nailed that test. I got 100%. You guys all need to work harder. <laughs> yeah, that would be boastful. What would a mock modest response be? It's not good enough. Uh, it was a really hard test. I know we all struggled on it. I was disappointed with my result. Oh, that's all good. Yeah, and everyone else got 40%. Oh. You just trying to fit in with the crowd. You right? Do this. That's the mock modesty. Yeah. So um, Aristotle says you should be honest in all cases. Yeah, that's Jesus. So you get 90% and then... Let's see how much of this you can do before the bell today, I reckon. Starting to say, well, go for it. Aristotle You can think of most of them I'm pretty straightforward. And there's a lot of groups. Modesty, modesty. On page 240, which is the same one, same double spread as that, 
table one. I want you to do, discuss questions two and four. I'd like you to write an answer to those. Yeah? And then finish off the table, please. And I would also like you to read the textbook summary on page 242 for chapters eight and nine. That's just the one page. Oh, well, I just press the one on Facebook and everyone can see it. Oh, yeah. I don't think that's a good one. Is it? That's like, they ain't got the end. Oh, you're going to make a complex. Did you take a photo, Andy? Yes. Did you Facebook it? Evan, you just got a photo. Oh, yeah. Hey Abdul, you want to dab to finish my video?